Hi, Dr. Joe. Greetings uh, from Asia. How are you, Nick? <laughs> Greetings from Seattle, Washington in the U.S. <laughs> wow, thousands of miles away. But thanks to technology, um, this, is, this is possible. I'm good, mm. Dr. Joe. How are you? I'm doing pretty well tonight. It's oh, night it's time evening. Here. Evening. Uh, it's yeah. Eastern time. It's Pacific time. Ah, uh, wait. So right Pacific, now it's seven it's a, p.m. Right, it's fifteen hours behind. Right. Wow. I'm, I'm getting pretty good at the time zones because of all the uh, guests that I'm speaking to. They're all mostly in the U.S. So, yes, Dr. Joe. Good evening to you. My name is Nicolette. I am the creator for the podcast titled "Your Wordless." Read that again. Juxtaposition of your very soul. First up, thank you very much for saying yes to be interviewed today. Uh, when I saw it, when I read your profile, <clears throat> when we were matched first time through Podmatch, I felt like I had to get you on the show simply because I myself experienced burnout the last two years. I think two years. So, wow. been been recovering. Uh, I was from my um, consulting uh, background, so um, I'd like to I'd like to just uh, get some insights from from the medical industry point of view, like how mm -hmm. how it is. So yes, um, that would be our conversation today. And, and as as my ritual, I would like to give a bit of introduction uh, on all my guests to my listeners today. So before we get right into business, so um, everyone, we have Dr. Joe Sherman here, who is he? a medical doctor, board certified pediatrician, master certified physician development coach, and consultant to individuals and healthcare organizations in the areas of carrier discernment, leadership, and provider well-being. His services include individual coaching, public speaking, workshop, and retreat facilitation. He has helped countless numbers of healthcare professionals find relief from burnout and rediscover the joy of practicing medicine. Wow. Dr. Joe has practiced pediatrics for over 35 years in the U.S., Uganda, and Bolivia. Early in his career, he was featured in the Washington Post and the Today Show for his successful leadership in delivering quality healthcare to underserved children and families. Yet despite the successes, Joe um, experienced episodes of profound burnout, which necessitated his leaving medicine temporarily to reflect on why he became a physician in the first place and whether he should return. He wrestled with his identity being defined by his profession rather than who he was independent of being a physician. Wow, something similar to what I went through. So it was during this time that Joe discovered Parker Palmer's writings and the Center for Courage and Renewal, which taught him how to find renewed clarity, commitment, and courage to act with integrity on what matters most to him without trying to live up to others' expectations. Woo! Wow. All right. Wow. So um, <laughs> you've already told my whole story, so yeah. I can we can just we can end, end it this. right here, I think. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, before we get straight into the conversation, um, Dr. Joe, could you share with us, what was it like growing up as Joe Sherman? Oh, wow. <laughs> I think about that a lot lately. At 64 years old, there's nothing I can do about it, but I grew up in, in the city of Washington, D.C., the capital city, and I'm the youngest of seven kids. So my father worked for the post office and never went to college. My mother never went to college and she was at home taking care of the seven kids. And I grew up looking at these other six people that were older than me, very competitive, very loving, very together. But my oldest brother is 20 years older than me and they all did their own thing and went their direction. And I wanted to do something completely different. Nobody was in healthcare and I, decided that that's a direction that I would head in. So I decided that I would like to become a doctor. Now, it's a long road to become a doctor, and I wasn't exactly sure that that was what I wanted to do, but that's the direction I headed in. And as I was in college, other things kind of sparked my interest. I really enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed counseling. I enjoyed mentoring and being with people in these other different kind of helping ways. But for some reason, it seemed like medicine was a direction to take where 
I could do many of those things in one place. So that's that's where I headed. But I have to say that my house was full of kids in a very small place in the city of uh, D.C., Washington, D.C. And uh, I was influenced very much, I think, by that family and the culture that we... Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Joe. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you mentioned a little bit about why you wanted to pursue medicine, right? And if we could go straight into, um, I think we're going to go back and forth a bit on some of the questions, but mm -hmm. in your opinion, or based on what you've gone through yourself, what are the leading causes of burnout among healthcare providers? Like I've yeah, seen I... online. Yeah. I've seen online nurses face it the most, but I don't know about doctors. So yeah. I would say right now, definitely in the United States, and I would say worldwide, um, mm. we're experiencing burnout in many different professions. In healthcare specifically, I think that there are, for physicians, as well as nurses, I would say, the major causes of burnout are being asked or required to do work that either is not what you uh, were trained to do or that you really want to be doing. Most of it has to do with administrative tasks, a lot of record keeping in the computer, a lot of clicks and checks and all these things that have nothing to do with taking care of patients. So I think that that is a major, uh, major problem. The other problem is that the technology in the world has advanced so rapidly and the amount that's expected of physicians and nurses and other people in healthcare has increased so much because knowledge has grown, technology has grown, the ability to communicate and reach healthcare providers has increased. So we still have the same healthcare provider trying to handle now all this information, all of this correspondence, all of this communication without the ability to handle it. So understaffing and inappropriate staffing to handle the type of work that's called on for physicians and nurses to do now is a major problem, major cause. I have, okay, the way I see it, I don't know. Maybe this is why we're having this conversation. There's two prong to it, right? Because you just mentioned we have the medical advancements. And then, so the paradox of it, if we're already advancing technologically in in all the industry, particularly the medicine um, world, why, uh, this is just me thinking out loud, why are we still understaffed? Isn't the technology supposed to alleviate the workload? I mean, I know becoming a doctor will take seven to 10 years if you want to specialize in something. And there's one, that's the paradox of it. And then number two, what do you think that the world or may, maybe narrow it down to just the medicine world, what do you think they should do to work in tandem with this technological advancement to avoid burnout? I mean, we're advancing, we have the technology, but then we have burnout as well. So it's like, it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> yeah. I think what it is, is that there is a disconnect with the, with the rate of growth of mm. technology and the culture yeah. of healthcare delivery. So we still live within this culture um, of our training in medical school. In the U.S., it takes at least 11 years, at least, <sighs> to become a doctor from right. finishing high school, secondary school. So you have yeah. four years of undergraduate study, four years of medical school, and at least three years. That's the minimum amount of residency for some specialties. Mm. And in that process, you have this 20-something-year-old kid, usually, yeah. Yeah. that enters this system. And the system is telling you, number one, you can't make a mistake. People's lives are at risk. So you have to get it right all the time. Mm. You cannot sleep. You cannot eat. You have to just keep working and never say no to anything. 
and don't ask for help because that shows that you're weak. So those are some of the elements of the culture that physicians are trained in. And those are the messages that are internalized, not directly. It's often some of those things are told to us directly, Inherent, but most right? of it like is just big... from experience. And yeah. we see what's expected of us. We see how our um, supervisors respond to us. Mm. So that's the way we go into practice. And it's a mm. tremendous amount of pressure. Because we're human beings. We make mistakes. We can't do anything, uh, do it all. We have to yeah. sleep. We have to do these things. That's so, right. So we aren't some type of superhuman people. At the same time, as we're given that message, we are often given the same message that we are somehow superhuman, that we are somehow should be put up on a pedestal and honored and esteemed and all of those things. Well, that's the way life was when I was kind of in medical school and training and got out in the 80s. Mm -hmm. But now with technology having rapidly expanded, a few things have happened. One is other, other professions and careers have far outpaced the income that doctors used to get. So disproportionately, people in the technology field, people in business, people in all kinds of other fields usually earn higher incomes. And in addition to that, along with the technology, medical advancements have increased. So the amount of knowledge, of medical knowledge out there is way too much for a single doctor to learn just in school. So you have to be able to have the skills to not know things and then look it up and try to find out. And the other thing about technology is that this computer in front of me now can contain all that information, all the correspondence, all of the billing and the coding and the insurance information. Everything is in this computer and in the electronic health record. And so the physician, the provider providing the care, not only is responsible to take care of the patient, but it's responsible to record all that information in this computer. So record the record of what happened bill the patient or the insurance company, make a referral through the computer, answer all emails and messages sent in by patients and other providers and nurses, uh, review all labs that are sent in, review all tests that are sent in. So all of these extra things are required because it all is contained in this computer in front of me. And so what we need to do and answer your second question is because what is now required of physicians has expanded so much to include all of this administrative information, yeah. all of this data entry, all of the billing, all of the coding. We need other people to be doing that part of the job for us because exactly. we're not I trained was just to do thinking that. that. Yeah, it's like they don't need to go to medical school, but at least like something specific Maybe, I don't know, some business degree, but uh, specializing in, I don't know, medical, but anybody can do it, I think, admin, because it's entry, entry type of um, task, right? Uh, so I think one of the answers would be for every physician or provider, I say provider, assistant. I include physicians, <laughs> nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, people that provide the direct medical care, yeah, people who actually can bill in the U.S. Everything's run off of private insurance, so mm -hmm. you have to bill everything. So for <sighs> every provider taking care of the patient, there should be someone else next to her, yeah. you know, there entering the information. And another yeah. person that's an expert at billing and insurance that's going to be able to do all the billing and insurance so that the doctor is just freed up to relieved from talk all to of the, the patient, yeah. examine the patient, make the diagnosis, create a plan, and then right. other people can do all that other work much, much better yeah. and more efficiently than a physician. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a buddy system. It's, we don't want to call it buddy, but it's like an assistant, but maybe one assistant to three doctors. Right. Well, it needs to be, to me, at least one, one to one. One to one. Wow. At least. At least. Now, there, is, there are systems right. around that have scribes, scribes uh -huh. that, that actually put in the data entry. 
Right. And I do think that that helps. And there's also technology now with AI coming along that with a voice recognition and AI advancement, there could be notes generated and everything generated automatically through AI. The problem is somebody has to review all that. Exactly. Somebody has to look it if over, make sure it's correct, <laughs> make sure all that. And so that takes time. That takes mm -hmm. time too. I just feel like the bottom line is that we're asking physicians to do so much more than we were trained to do. And we're not given extra time to do it. You're expected to just fit in all their extra stuff as you're seeing patients. I can, okay, so just, just to share my own story, not my story, but I have a younger sister. She graduated in the med medical MD, so she got her doctor, but she went into her, um, I think, what do you call that, residency? And within one week, he, she quit. Wow. And my dad was is still salty until today, but because my dad, because I graduated as an accountant, so she's a doctor. So my dad, we for for him, it's education is key. So she wanted a better life for both of us. Uh, he wanted a better life for both of us. So he was like the um, the hope, right? And um, well, she, when she she quit, she said to my mom, "I don't think I want to do this. I don't think I can do this." So she quit, and then she um, she left. She left the field. So my dad was kind of disappointed, but somehow came to terms with that after a few years. And it's been, I think, 2019, 2021. Yeah, but it's been five years. And, and then just last year, a cousin of ours did residency for two years <laughs> halfway through. So, and, and that's, uh, she's, I think, 29. My, my sister quit when she was 28. So it's, it's real. <laughs> <laughs> the struggle yeah. is real. That's amazing. You see, if people are impacted that early on, when they're yeah. still in residency, you can imagine people who go out into practice and they've already finished all their years of residency and they're in debt. Like in the U.S., medical yeah. school is extremely yeah, expensive. The, yeah, because it's under scholarship. So she's also bonded by the government to the government. So yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have... Well, we're starting to get a few medical schools in the U.S. Mm -hmm. where because of wealthy donors, the education is free. And I don't know, if I had my way, I yeah. believe we should make all medical education free for everybody. And there should be some type of, some type of mandatory service, so mandatory work in an underserved area in the country that would compensate for the amount of money that that the government would invest in your medical education. So then that way, people would come out of their medical training without any debt at all, make choices as far as what specialty to go into, or what kind of medicine, without worrying about this burden of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars like, yeah. that you owe mm. so that in that situation, you wouldn't find yourself in a job that you are afraid to leave because you That's have to so keep true. paying back your loans. That is so true. That is so true. Yeah. It's like, because I mean, I mean, it goes with any other jobs, right? Like you should be doing it out of passion instead of fear and um it's yeah it's it's sad but i don't know what what is your projection or what do you foresee happening to the medical industry well right now i feel like we are rapidly privatizing most of healthcare in the u.s and hospital systems and so it used to be that we had several hospitals that were nonprofit hospitals run by charitable organizations or government run hospitals, healthcare that were either all nonprofit or government run. Now many hospitals and healthcare systems are being bought by private equity firms, venture capitalists, investors to make profit. 
And the problem is that the profit margin in healthcare, especially in hospital care, is very narrow. Yeah. So what happened in the uh, COVID pandemic is all of the uh, activities that hospitals usually rely on to bring in profit were shut down. Elective surgeries, procedures, all of these things that typically have a higher profit margin. All the efforts were shifted toward acute care. So care of acute illnesses, especially, you know, seriously life-threatening illnesses, COVID. And that's where it's usually a money losing operation for many hospitals. So then that put a tremendous amount of economic pressure on hospitals after the peak of the pandemic to try to make up to for it. all of those yeah. losses. So that meant cutting staff, trying oh to get God. by in a bare bones budget, which then puts the people <sighs> remaining under the pressure yeah. of trying to produce and take care of patients with less support. Mm. So from my perspective, either the whole thing is going to implode yeah, yeah, <laughs> and everybody yeah. is going to leave because right now in the U.S., yeah. uh, the number of physicians and nurses that are leaving practice mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. increasing dramatically. Really? And something's <laughs> got to change. Yes. Many of those people who are physicians, many of them are deciding to open up private offices that are... Um, direct pay models, like a membership fee. You pay every month to go to the doctor anytime you need it, but no insurance is billed, no insurance is involved, and the physicians don't, don't uh, charge insurance. So they're doing everything very privately on their own and just collecting cash payments from their patients. So that's one method. Uh, that some physicians have chosen to a direction that they've taken. Other people have chosen to leave clinical medicine because they're burned out. They don't have enough hours in the day to complete all their work and still be present to their families or whatever else they want. So they leave clinical medicine and go into other fields such as pharmaceutical industry, biotech, or consulting or other professions like that. So something's got to happen that is going to decrease the administrative burden on physicians and improve the staffing of our hospitals and clinics so it's safe or else everything will fall apart. We just have to create it all new again. Can you share with me, Dr. Sherman, because how does the model work in the U.S.? So. Um, just now you mentioned a lot of people are going and opening up their own practice versus the existing one. So, yeah, I, I've heard of, I know healthcare is super expensive in the U.S., but I don't know how expensive. So it'd be nice if you could share with, with me. <laughs> I'll try to explain it very briefly. Okay. <laughs> but U.S. healthcare system is based on a private insurance model. Mm -hmm. And it is also based on an employer shared expense right. for health okay. insurance model. Okay. Okay. There are a few, two major government insurance programs in the U.S., right. Medicare and Medicaid. Okay. Medicare is an insurance program that provides medical insurance for the elderly over 65, as well as people who are disabled. Hmm. Medicaid provides health insurance for those who are low income, so for the poor. So those are the only two populations that have some type of government uh, or sponsored insurance. Mm -hmm. Unless you're a prisoner, you also are covered by government insurance, as well as the VA system and the whole military uh, oh. medical system. But other than that, everyone else is dependent on private insurance right. that they must pay for. Employers for uh, full-time employees have a cost sharing arrangement, usually as a benefit to employees, where they pay some of the cost of that health insurance, but every employee usually pays at least a part of it, if not the majority of it, 
And then if they want their families covered, they pay even more. So everyone has to be paying out of pocket for health insurance. What that health insurance gets you is not complete coverage of all your health care. It only pays a portion of that amount. So then you still have to pay, besides those monthly premiums for the insurance, mm. you still have out-of-pocket costs that you must pay in order for the insurance companies to make a profit. They always have some cost-sharing that also includes what they call co-pay or co-insurance. If I go see a doctor, my insurance company will pay part of the bill and then I have to pay part of the bill. So it's this very complex system that uh, is all based on private health insurance. So say, because, okay, I'm not, okay, so in Malaysia, we have um, the same, I think, Medicare, that's for um, low-income earners. And, but we also have insurance providers that are privatized. So we, so for example, like I have a medical card that I pay per month premium and it would say, okay, there's a coverage of 1 million per year. So for example, touch wood, <laughs> I need to go to a surgery. So, and it's covered until I exhaust that 1 million within that year. And then it, it's, it's covered until then. And then the new, new calendar year, then it gets renewed. So that's separate to employees, full-time employees like myself with, and we have a separate um, insurance that is covered by, okay, half of my employer and half will be take, deducted from my salary. So, so we have two. So I, for extra protection, I can buy a separate one. And then there's one when I'm attached. So let's say I am now leaving my nine to five, which I am <laughs> soon to start my own therapy and coaching. So that means I will be relying on the one that I've taken separately on my own. And okay, so this insurance say there something happens, something bad happens, or in, in the event of death, then there is, you know, a pay and they give to the beneficiaries and whatnot and disabilities as well. So is it, is it something similar like that in the US? So as I understand what you're saying is that if you become self-employed, yeah, meaning you don't have an employer, you have your That's own right. business, yeah, yeah, then you can purchase a private insurance That's policy. Right. That's right. Yes. And that private insurance policy will pay part of the bills that you get. Is that correct? Or is that if, the one that will has the limit? Uh, no, it is. So if self-employed, they will pay if if it's included in the policy like if diagnose if the diagnosis is part of the inside the list of i would say illnesses that they have listed out then it will be covered everything will be covered by the uh, the insurance provider. so there's an actual list of diagnoses that they cover yeah. and so some that like they do not usually, yeah so usually like aids is not covered so certain policies will have will cover cancer, but not all. Only recently, in recent years, yeah. What do you do if you get a diagnosis that so, is not covered? Um, oh, uh, so it's either you go to the, again, this, this is a fund. So although you, you are self-employed, because I used to be employed before, so I can still apply to that fund that say, okay, I've been diagnosed and I'm not earning. I can't earn because I'm diagnosed uh, with this. Therefore, I would like to make an application for this. So there's one, the personal uh, insurance that yeah, you buy. Sure. It sounds like it sounds like it is somewhat similar to our private insurance mm. uh, that we have here. Although it also sounds like, and I'm not sure if it's included in the health insurance, that you also have life insurance and disability yeah. insurance. Yes, yes, yes. So it, here, those separate, would be though. completely yeah. separate things. Separate. So life is oh, different. Okay. Medical is different. Okay. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, I think, so mm. in Malaysia, is there a government system of healthcare? Yes. Yes, we do. There is. So there is, yeah. can any Malaysian citizen get services from those government facilities? Oh yeah, so uh, Malaysian citizens, we just need to pay one buck 
or five bucks. A small amount. To get, yes, a very minimal and, amount. And everyone has has access to those places. Has access. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, are how's the quality of that care? Actually, we have really quite good ones. University that is tied with with hospital, like yeah, yeah. So um, and and. In Malaysia, we have the National Heart Institute that is among the best in Southeast Asia. So we're in terms of the basic healthcare, we would not it's not actually subpar to the private ones. It's of quality. Of course you want to go to the private ones and it's better services, fancier building, fancier mm-hmm. lobbies. But but quality okay, again my again another <laughs> story. My um brother-in-law was diagnosed with lymphoma back in 20 yeah and we thought we wanted the best by going to a private but then even they referred to the national hospital and say okay go here and i and they had the the scan they had the immunotherapy and everything yeah so he free and then relapsed for a bit and then remission so right now he's He's in the recovery stage. Oh, great. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, we In the U.S., we do not have government hospitals. We used to have some local jurisdictions had public hospitals right. public where hospital, yeah. the government, the, the local government, either the state government or city government or county government, tax uh, tax money finance those those hospitals. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't exist anymore. Now everything's privatized. Everything is so you pay for everything. We do not have those types of government facilities, and um, unless it again, unless it's associated with the military. So I think what it comes down to, and from my perspective, is is healthcare a commodity, just like you buy a car or you have cable service or, you know, belong to um, a health club and you decide, um, this is something that I would like to have in my life. So I want to purchase it, I pay for it. Or is it a fundamental right of society? Do we as society believe that it is in our best interest together, so collectively and individually for everyone in the country to be healthier. And if that's true, if we truly believe that, then we would be paying as part of our tax structure into some type of system that would have a much better safety net system of healthcare for everyone in the country. And that to me is the only answer that we that we need to to get to we need to reach eventually i'm just curious so there are people who doesn't have insurance in states right that will be people well because of our what they call obamacare but it is the affordable care act um the it actually is required for people to have some type of health insurance coverage but we do have each state has a collection of private insurance policies that have been Mm -hmm. collected that Mm -hmm. are available for everyone to purchase. So if I'm Mm self-employed, so I go to that state health insurance exchange and look for a policy that I can purchase. Mm -hmm. And what I pay for that policy is dependent on my income to some degree. Right. So if I have below a certain income, then I can receive tax credits for the uh, payment that. of that premium right, so that right. my premium costs less in that situation. Mm-hmm. So that's that's something close to what I think would be helpful to have. And yes, it's yet it's imperfect and it is complex and complicated. And but I do think it was a step in the right direction. Now, politically, people, at least in the Democratic Party in the U.S., speak much more about what they say, Medicare for all, which means taking that government health insurance, 
where the government is the insurer and expanding it somehow to the entire population to some degree. Oh, wow. Thank you, Dr. Joe. Oh, we got sidetracked on <laughs> Yeah, we got sidetracked. Health policy. <laughs> I, yeah. But I love, I love this kind of conversation. I mean, we just let it, uh, we just let it flow. Okay, so coming back to right now. So we know changes are still being made and it cannot take into effect as soon as we want to. So what can physicians do to avoid burnout? Yeah, so what burnout is as a definition, a specific definition, it is a combination of emotional exhaustion. It's from emotional exhaustion. So not just physical work and the hours put in, but emotionally you're exhausted. And as a result, you start to become depersonalized from your patients, the people you're taking care of. It's almost like you're just going through the motions. You, you really don't have that connection with the person that you're trying to take care of. And the other thing is that you feel like you're really having no impact whatsoever in, in general with all of your efforts. So you just have this sense of emotional exhaustion, feeling depersonalized and feeling like you have just no sense of contribution that you're making. So obviously, if you have all of those feelings, then if you do stay where you are and doing what you're doing, then what happens is you start to exhibit other behaviors, such as being irritable or snappy at people, not being polite or feeling depressed, feeling anxious, making mistakes not being able to focus, all kinds of other types of symptoms that, that you end up having. And then people who are physicians, instead of seeking help from either a therapist or from a coach or someone else that could possibly support them with trying to find their way through and finding answers to how to get out of it, because we have been told in our culture of medicine that we shouldn't ask for help. Remember, we're supposed to be able to do it ourselves, mm. be strong, be tough. So it's really hard to get physicians to actually reach out for help and support. But if they do, I think it's a major help. It's a major answer to burnout because you have to really approach burnout from two arms, two directions. One's the personal individual focus, which helps an individual person really take stock in what they're doing, what they've committed to do. Is this really what they want to do? How can they make that job work for them so that they have a good balance in their lives, that they can take care of themselves, that they can spend time with their families, their friends, doing life-giving activities in addition? So that's the personal side. Then there's the structural organizational side. How can we create a work environment that that physician feels supported, that physician feels valued, and that physician feels like they are, uh, they are working for a common mission as the organization. So those are the directions to take. Any type of interventions that are both on the personal side coaching, therapy, retreats, work like that, as well as the structural organizational side, we can work together to try to battle burnout. So it's like, it's like a chicken and egg thing. The system is not, it's imperfect. And then you have the therapy and the coaches come in and try to battle that so that this original thing can be straightened out. The original problem can be straightened out. So it's like... <laughs> I, I just don't understand, but okay, I, this is <laughs> beyond me. So, Dr. Joe, how can physician, physicians and other providers restore their love of medicine? From my perspective and the way I work with my individual clients, as well as groups, I bring physicians together for retreats to try to help reflect and nice. to really understand why it is that you do what you do. Exactly. Because I think we've lost touch with why we wanted to be doctors in the first place. Yeah. Because we were told 
that it has to be done a certain way. Mm-hmm. And that's the only way it can be done. Mm-hmm. So we kind of, we lose our autonomy. We lose our sense of agency in trying to choose a direction to take. So the first thing that I do with my clients is that I try to go back to those moments in their lives where they felt like they were in the perfect place for them, that they felt like they could be their authentic selves, that they felt that they could express fully who they were and feel as if they were in the right place and they were doing what they loved doing. Take that experience and then it's almost like you dissect it. What was happening? Who was involved? Where were you? How did you feel? What made you feel that way? What were the elements that were present to truly make that such a fulfilling experience? What were the values that you hold so dear to yourself that were able to be manifested in that experience? Okay, great. Now we have certain elements and values and components of who we really are. We let our lives and our life experiences teach us who we are and our reactions and our responses to that physically, emotionally, spiritually, everything. Then as we have that kind of starting to figure that out, we don't have all the answers as far as that's concerned. We're all still evolving, learning, changing, I believe. Then we look at your current reality. How much of this is present in your current reality? If it's zero, right? Maybe you're in the wrong place, yeah. right? But usually there's some component of it. Usually there are certain aspects of what you're doing in your current reality that do manifest these values, that do create these elements and experiences for you. It's just that you don't notice them because they flash by so quickly and all you do is focus on all the misery that's there. So one thing to do is to try to get people to focus on what is working. What is positive about your experience? What is it that you can be present to? Oh, good. Yeah, there's this and this. And when I get to do this, when I, when I get to take care of newborn babies and talk to new moms, then I get excited because I kind of relive that whole experience when I was a new parent and how stressful it was and how much trouble I had. But then there's all this stuff that I learned that I about what works and what doesn't work and how I can help you. All right, if that's where you experience it, how about trying to expand the amount of time that you take care of newborn babies. Well, I can't control my schedule because I've got so many things and they just put those things in there. It's like, have you asked? Have you gone and requested more slots, more appointments for newborn babies? Well, no, I don't do that. Nobody. Well, let's try it. And so part of it is taking what works and trying to expand it. Yeah. And part of yeah, it is taking yeah. what doesn't work and trying to clip it off a little bit. Yeah, take what works and expand it. That is a good one. What it is that brings you joy, what it is that brings your soul to the workplace, Mm -hmm. and what is it that just drains your soul Mm -hmm. whenever you do it. And with some of my clients, as we go through this process, they look at the reality and they can't find enough positives. They can't find, or they try and ask to have changes made and the employer says no. In that case, then we start looking elsewhere. What's the percentage of them staying in the medical field and leaving when they go to your retreat? So when they go to you, when when they go to you, when you have your clients, what's the percentage of them staying in the medical field versus leaving the medical field? 50, 50. Leaving medicine altogether? Yes. Working with me? Yeah. Nobody, nobody who didn't have that idea to begin with. If somebody Mm -hmm. had the idea that they were forced into it and that they really don't want to be doing it anymore, Mm -hmm. then I'm not the one that convinces them that. I mean, as a coach, 
I don't tell anybody what to do. I I, I don't know what they should do, to be honest with you. Yeah. I just try to have them answer the questions that access their own wisdom, mm. their own experience, mm. what's inside that exists there already, and give them some tools to help them do that. Perfect. I will be using that too on my own practice. <laughs> there you Thank go. Thank you. Dr. Joe. Okay, Dr. Joe, what are the keys to connecting the C-suite to the front lines in healthcare institutions? Mm, all right. You're from Malaysia, right? Yes. Have you ever been to the U.S.? No, I would love to. <laughs> Come visit I would me. Be, I, I would, yes, I would. Washington, D.C., right? So well, I've got a friend I who's... I know. I am now in, in Seattle, uh, Washington. Wait, wait. Seattle, yes. Yeah, Seattle, yeah. Washington. So a friend is leaving. I've got since speaking started speaking so i've i've made i'll be appearing in a radio station virtually in um she's a coach so she's i forgot what's the name of the radio station but once it's once it airs i will let you know um that's in new york and i've got some somebody few few people most of them are in la canada and i've got a friend going to boston so i think okay. It's, it's about time. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, let me try another example. Have All you right. visited other countries besides Malaysia? Yeah. Um, but Asia, uh, mm -hmm. Japan, Philippines, Australia. Yeah. Where? Mostly in Asia. Australia. Okay. Philippines. So yeah. let me ask you this question. When you go to Australia and you come into Australia and you speak English, obviously, very well, and so Thank you. You, you may not be able to me, understand right? the accent of the Australian. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Wow. That, that but be... yesterday, funny enough, yesterday, Dr. Joe, I had a, an Australian. <laughs> he was like, good day, mate. I'm like, oh, good day. But um, yeah, I told him I'm from Malaysia. So so yeah, we, we, so, we managed to, to hold that conversation for an hour. So, <laughs> so if you <laughs> go <good>. to Australia, <laughs> right, mm -hmm. it's a different culture. Yeah. They speak a different well, they don't speak a different language. But if you went to Japan, do you speak Japanese? No. No. So if you went to Japan, different culture, different language, different customs, different ways of doing things, maybe different values. Maybe they value yeah. certain things differently. Right. Maybe they value uh, status mm -hmm. more than honesty. Mm. So you might not tell the truth if it's going to compromise your status. Mm -hmm. Some cultures, mm -hmm. that's that's different. So if you were to go to that country, you go to Japan and you're interacting with people, mm -hmm. right? And you're interacting with people from that culture. What are some of the things that you do in order to function, get along and communicate and just live there? I always have this saying, when you're in Rome, act like the Romans. <laughs> okay. And how um, do you do that? I just, I research and follow the crowd. I would so not you do watch that. and yeah. observe? Observe, yeah. Watch so you and observe, observe, you watch, you try to learn. Yeah. Try to learn what are the customs, how do they, you know, what are these language? Maybe I learned some words, the meaning of some words. What is it that motivates them? Why do mm. they do the things that they do? How can mm. I communicate with them? Mm -hmm. How can I interact with them? Yeah. How can I? So you become interested and curious and, and try to learn from that, right? Right. So now we have a group of doctors who come from the culture of medicine, culture of, of becoming formed as a doctor and that whole medical culture. Then over here, we have all of the Profit administrators <laughs> and all of the administrators come from the culture of business. Business has a whole different vocabulary, different motivations, different values, different everything. Medicine has this difference. So what happens when you come together? Do you watch, listen, become curious, ask questions, try to learn as much as you can about the other culture? No. You argue, you fight, you bang heads, you try to fight for your culture and your, right? You don't land on the shores of Japan saying, Malaysia forever, get you out of my face. I don't want to talk Japanese. I don't want to get, right? Yes. But that's yes. what happens. 
in our medical system. The physicians and the medical personnel, those professionals meet the business people and they bang heads. Instead of saying, we're all humans, we would, what is our common mission? What do we have in common? How can I be curious and learn from you? How can I learn the vocabulary of the business of healthcare? How can I learn the culture of the business of healthcare? And for an administrator, how do I learn why doctors do what they do, why they behave the way they do, why they don't understand what I'm talking about? Curious, really invested in the other people. That's the answer. That's the way to begin. Have empathy. Absolutely. I mean, and it starts with that one person, which is you. <laughs> All right, um, Dr. Joe, what is next for you? Next for me? Yes. Hopefully you go to bed tonight. It's getting <laughs> oh. late. And, uh... <laughs> what time do you go to bed? Eight? <laughs> no, I think I'll try to relax a little bit. I have to catch okay. up on some some notes and things of people that I saw today. Right. Um, next in my life, you think? Yes, yes. Okay. Or in your profession. That's all right. Mm. I love, you know, I've lived in Uganda. I've lived in Bolivia. I've lived overseas. A lot of different places. I love traveling. I love coaching. I love uh, doing retreats. My wife is a psychologist, so she and I are doing retreats together. Wow, and amazing. so um, <laughs> we have one coming up next week. It's called Soul Care for Helpers and Healers. And we're going to bring together about eight therapists, chaplains, coaches, eight people of different health helping professions. And we're just going to come together, take care of ourselves and each other for a weekend, do a little bit of reflection and some meditation, some Qigong, some, some creative stuff. And, uh, I love doing that stuff. I love it. I love uh. that. And I enjoy working with people to try to discover who they really are and how to bring that into fruition into their yeah. lives and that's why i'm moving in this direction as well speaking to you is like um the stars are aligning most of my guests are yeah it's like a nudge Whew. all right um okay a few more questions dr joe i'm gonna pivot to a self-worth question because my podcast talks a lot about self-worth so a question for you dr joe <clears throat> imposter syndrome is a common challenge that affects people in various fields how can one overcome imposter syndrome and recognize their true value and capabilities? Number one, admit it. Admit it. When I was in academic medicine and I didn't do any research and I didn't have any publications and I walked into a conference room with all the other people that had the publications and the, and the ranks and the titles, I felt like I was not as good as them. I felt like they were smarter than me. They, they knew how to do research and I didn't. Now, first thing is I admit it. It's the way I feel and that stinks. I hate it. I hate feeling that way, right? Then after I admit that I really feel that way and I don't deny it, then I start to think, all right, if they have that for them, what do I have? Talking to parents and I can really make kids laugh and have fun. And I really know people pretty well. And I communicate fairly well. And so there are certain things that I have that perhaps they don't have. Maybe they do. Let me ask. Let me be curious. So admit it and then see what it is that you do have. What is it that are your strengths? And focus on that. Focus on those things. And the other thing is just to realize that everybody else in the room has a little bit of that same imposter syndrome. So just like I'm looking across the room and I see over there, oh gosh, there's Nick. She knows everything there is about podcasting. I do not know the first thing. What is this platform we're using? I couldn't even log on to it. Oh my God, I'll never know as much as she does. Nick is over there going, wow, who is this doctor? Yeah. What in the world? <laughs> so realize that we're all human. We're all in this together. Yeah. We all feel imperfect. We all feel shame. We feel guilt. We feel worthless at times. And that's part of being a human. So 
you know, join the human race. So which we already are, just have to remember. All right, Dr. Joe, two more before I let you go. What okay. is your heart's greatest wish? Ooh. Ooh. Wow, that's a big one. <laughs> My heart's greatest wish is that everyone finds the love for themselves to enable them to truly discover who they are and who they were meant to be in this world. And that we all encourage each other to do the same thing. Uh. <laughs> oh, well, how can I add more to that? There's nothing to add more to that. There's nothing else. Last question for you, Dr. Joe. If you could create a quote right now for you to leave to the audience listening in the world as your legacy, what would it be? You ask such easy questions, my God. <laughs> I get that a lot. Okay. I'm going to, it's terrible because I'm going to paraphrase someone else's. That's okay. <laughs> but I won't quote it directly. I will cite him though. His okay. name is Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman is a writer um, and uh, I believe theologian from the U.S. in the early part of the 20th century. And he said something like this, spend the, spend the time to discover your authentic self, because if you don't, you will spend the rest of your days dancing on the strings of someone else's puppets. Uh, master. Yes, yes. That is what I preach every day. <laughs> and then also the reason you. why I start my podcasting. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sherman. The conversation has been super fun, engaging, and insightful. Um, I love what you do. You're doing great work and you are now one of my role models to continue to do what I am about to do what I'm about to embark on. I mean, leaving nine to five, jumping from business into therapy and coaching. That's something. Yeah. So, yes. You see that? <laughs> wow. There's you a know I could do that. I have magic powers. Oh. I can send you love. Whoa. Receive. I can I can party you with can you be... if I want to. You're funny, Doctor Joe. I can I mean I can no. send fireworks, wow. everything. And no wonder um, parents like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I wish you the best, Doctor Joe. Um, Thank you so much. The best in in in. I hope you have the best life, and I hope you have the greatest success with your retreat and whichever workshop that you're gonna have in the future. I wish Let's you the keep... best too. Thank, Thank you, you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Likewise. Thank you for your time, Dr. Joe. I mean, I am honored. <laughs> let's let's stay in touch. I do you have LinkedIn? Yes, I do. Okay. I will connect you. And I have a website. It's right. Joe Sherman MD dot com. Very easy. Joe Sherman. Joe Sherman MD. And, and you can reach me at Joe at Joe Sherman MD dot com. And all of my um, services, my story and um, articles, blog, all kinds of things are on my website. Um, so it's available there. And if you are a physician, mm -hmm. a nurse, nurse practitioner, health professional, and you are feeling a bit lost or not sure what to do next, please reach out to me. Um, you can schedule a free um, consultation to talk it over and decide what the best course of action is. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, Dr. Joe. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Good night.